so kind of you. I'll put it in my pocket. Now, I don't know whether this helps or hurts. It makes a little difference. It makes a little difference. Um, well, um, uh, in the public sphere, and that's really an important uh, aspect, they constitute themselves in the public sphere. Now, as part of extended families. That is, um, FD starts to be a disease of cousins. People start to speak of themselves as belonging to the same family. And that family is qualified over and over again as being Jewish. There are lovely examples uh, that one can give. Uh, the one that I um, quote is from uh, a letter that I received from the head of one of the FD family groups um, in which uh, she says that, um, and I'll simply quote her, that the origins of this di disease took place years ago when there was a spontaneous mutation. Perhaps, she writes, his mother ate too much borscht. Right? In other words, what happens is they start to think of themselves in the public spheres as now a, not just genetically related, but related also in some kind of, and I'm going to use this term in a qualified way, racial term. Now, one argument one can make, of course, with both Fanconia's anemia and FD is that there is a much, much higher rate among Jews and other groups, but then we have to qualify what we mean by Jews. What happens, of course, is that we start to look at a genetic allele that happens to overlap with certain ancestry, with certain cultural groups, not with a racial category. But what is important is that these categories are read now through a notion of the biological inheritance here of the Jews. By the way, one can do the same absolute thing that has been done very elegantly um, in looking at diseases ascribed to other quote-unquote racial groups. Um, why this is of interest is that it creates now an identity, and that's why this notion of a Jewish genetic disease is for me an interesting one, um, that associates a specific group now with disease. Genetics is a very complicated way of viewing the body. It becomes a way now of limiting illness. One case that I cite, which is the case of a couple in Louisiana that has a child, and that child fails to thrive, uh, and it's only after the child is virtually at death's door that the child is defined or diagnosed as having Tay-Sachs, because Tay-Sachs is a quote-unquote Jewish disease and there are no Jewish ancestors. Of course, it's not a Jewish disease. It's a disease of a large group of people who are related genetically, a genetic allele. So we've got on the one hand this very strong notion that if you can define yourself, you can both limit right, where that disease is to be found, but you then redefine yourself now in terms of the potential for illness. It becomes, in a sense, a way of talking about yourself in the public sphere. And what is remarkable about both Fanconi anemia and FD is how these patient collectives have begun to think of themselves now in the public spheres as Jewish collectives. Now, the historic parallel to this, and that's what interests me, the historic parallel to this is, of course, the history of diabetes uh, as a quote unquote Jewish disease. In the end of the 19th century, uh, diabetes is literally called the Jewish disease with capital T, capital J, capital D. Um, it is assumed uh, that the Jews, because of their inherited nature, so there's a, a very strong, can we say, eugenics component to this, because of their inherited nature, because of their laziness, because of their obesity, um, because of their innate inability to deal with the pressures of modern life, develop diabetes. What is, of course, interesting in comparison to what is going on is that the exact same thing happens, is that Jews themselves start to think about themselves as a diabetic race. Right? There's a wonderful, very old joke about a Russian, a Frenchman, and a Jew 
trapped in the desert. And they finally find a town, and there's a bar. And the Russian goes in, and he says, I am so thirsty. I must have, I must have a vodka. And the Frenchman goes in and says, I am so extraordinarily thirsty. I must, I must, I must have a glass of wine. And the Jew goes in and says, I am so very thirsty. I must have diabetes. <laughs> Old joke, but one that reflects on that notion of an internalization. Now, Jewish scientists, serious scientists of the 19th and early 20th century, begin to wrestle with the notion of why Jews are diabetic. And of course, what they do is they flip all of these categories, lifestyle, inheritance, the pressure of modernity on their heads to sort of explain Jewish diabetes. Now, one of the interesting problems of diabetes, as many of you know, is that it is only very late in the 1930s and 1940s when Banting and Best do their work in insulin that type 1 diabetes, which is inherited diabetes, is in a sense teased out from type 2 diabetes. Uh, it is the diabetes, one of the um, lack of the production of insulin as opposed to the ability to use insulin uh, that is uh, uh, produced. And it is only in 1964, it is only in 1964 um, that a uh, geneticist working um, on white rats, uh, not on Jews, um, comes up with a notion that what is really going on uh, with this sudden presence of diabetes among Jews has to do with something which is called the um, thrifty genotype. And the thrifty genotype, um, the example is used in a wonderful paper from 1973 um, looking at Yemenite Jews coming into Israel. Uh, if you look at Jews in Yemen, they have a much lower rate of diabetes, a much lower rate of diabetes than um, the general population and the general population of Jews in Israel. Uh, they come into Israel, and within a year, they have a much higher rate. And the thrifty genotype basically says that when you're in a, an environment where, in point of fact, there is a, a, a lack, right, where there is a harsh environment where you have limited access to food, and then you come into an environment when there is a lot of food, what happens is your body, which is used to producing sugar um, in a very limited way, suddenly has an overproduction, and what happens is you get diabetes. It's situational, in other words. It is not inherited, even though it has, and I'm going to stress this, a genetic component. But the answer, of course, is that any people, any person, who moves from a harsh environment to an environment of overabundance has at least the potential if you believe in the notion of the th uh, thrifty genotype, of developing diabetes. Now, this is an interesting example. I'm going to end uh, my presentation with this because, in point of fact, when we start to think about this sort of public sphere aspect of how people respond to the charge of being ill, even though they may be only, quote, unquote, carriers of illness, by constructing an identity around these illnesses, one of the incredible dangers, and it's a practical, real danger right now in terms of medical research, is that the way you respond to this is to take a category called race. And that is, of course, what has happened in uh, Western medical research in the last 10 years, is that race and gender have been reintroduced or introduced for the first time as categories about thinking about illness. I'm going to make an argument that at least race, and we can have such an enormous baggage in the way that we construct who we are. It has such an enormous baggage that it provides not a good model for identifying, dealing with illnesses that are genetically tr transmitted or at least have the illnesses that may potentially be genetically transmitted, but rather it obfuscates this. The notion, for example, that FD is a disease of cousins, and that phrase comes up over and over and over again, that is, of an extended family, blinds us to the potential that that mutation may occur 
in any genetic allele. There is an old truism that everybody knows who his or her mother is. And the truth of genetics is that our fathers are always in question. Thank you very much.